Welcome everyone and good evening. My name is Ashokan. I am the Executive Director of uh, um, Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute at the University of Waterloo. And today we are uh, in the third event of our October Cybersecurity Month series. And it's a special event we are because we are kicking off a, a new lecture series called CPI Talks. Um, move to slide three, please, Davian. Let me begin with uh, territorial acknowledgement. Uh, many of us at the University of Waterloo live and work in the traditional ter territory that belong to the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, our campus is situated on the Haldimand Track, which is a land granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of uh, the Grand River. Um, we, uh, each of us can in our own way um, recognize this and acknowledge the, the territory that uh, we live and work in. And I'll, I'll invite uh, uh, all of us to take a moment to reflect on this uh, acknowledgement. Next slide, please. So before I introduce uh, today's speakers, um, I want to give a little bit of an overview of uh, um, what CPI Talks, uh, the lecture series is about. And, uh, and why the reasons behind uh, starting this. So CPI Talks is a public outreach uh, lecture series, uh, meaning that it is intended for the general public. So it doesn't, those lectures don't assume any prior expertise in cybersecurity or privacy. And the idea is that we would have, uh, we would invite um, experts in, uh, in different disciplines of cybersecurity and privacy uh, um, and have them explain uh, current important issues in cybersecurity and privacy in a way that's accessible to the general public. And, uh, and, and we are going to be inviting uh, speakers, like today's speakers, who are not only experts, but are also role models to um, um, students and, and younger researchers and uh, practitioners. Um, we have three goals in, uh, uh, in launching a series like this. First is that as a university level institute, it is within the mission of uh, uh, CPI to inform and educate the public on, on uh, uh, issues that are uh, of importance with respect to cybersecurity and privacy. So that's the primary reason why we are launching this. And we expect that uh, there'll be about uh, four to six talks, once in every two or three months um, uh, throughout the year. So even though we are launching this in the Cybersecurity Month uh, series of events, CPA talks will live on and continue on. But I have two other objectives for doing this. Um, the second is that um, uh, we also want to be able to reach um, um, high school students and younger undergrad students who are thinking about uh, uh, potential career choice. And by having them uh, listen to experts uh, and role models talk about security and cybersecurity and privacy problems, um, we hope that we can inspire some of them to think about a career in uh, cybersecurity and privacy. Um, the third reason is that cybersecurity and privacy, uh, by its very nature, uh, a cross disciplinary endeavor. And uh, by having experts in, in uh, you know, some discipline of cybersecurity and privacy, explain their, their issues in an accessible way, uh, we are also hoping that this would bridge the, the gap between disciplines uh, of different uh, experts who are interested in cybersecurity and privacy but come from different backgrounds. Um, so um, uh, we hope that uh, we'll, we'll be able to achieve uh, these three objectives. So with this, uh, let me introduce uh, today's speakers. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, very privileged and honored to introduce two of my colleagues, uh, Professor Jen Whitson and Professor Ian Goldberg. Um, uh, they will talk today on privacy research that matters. So let me just briefly introduce them before I hand over to them. Um, Jen Whitson is a sociologist. Um, uh, she has been working on uh, studying the sociological aspects of uh, the software industry and how it uh, uh, affects uh, uh, our lives. And in particular, she has been focusing on the game industry. Ian Goldberg is a computer scientist. Um, he's also the uh, Canada Research Chair in, uh, in uh, privacy technolo enhancing technologies. 
Uh, he's a well-known figure in, in the privacy community, um, having worked uh, earlier in the industry and, and having contributed, made significant contributions to uh, security and privacy. And his focus is on uh, developing um, useful and usable technologies for uh, ensuring the security and privacy of uh, internet users. With that, uh, Ian and Jen, I invite you to uh, deliver the inaugural talk. All right, thanks. I am just going to start our PowerPoint here, so bear with me all. Uh, welcome all, thank you for attending over your dinner hour. I really appreciate it. Uh, we uh, wish we were sitting in our local, you know, Kitchener Public Library or somewhere else and seeing you face to face, but this will have to do. Um, so because it's virtual, it's easier for us if uh, we proceed with the talk uh, and you put any questions that you may have of any sort in the Q&A, and then we'll have time to uh, engage and answer them and chat with you after that. Um, so without further ado, I want to hand it over to Professor Goldberg. Thanks, Jen. I want to open with what may be a surprisingly tricky question. What is privacy? When many people think of privacy, they think privacy is about hiding personal information. Perhaps more subtly, maybe hiding personal information from particular people or companies while allowing others to see it. And this notion is a very common conception of privacy. It can be extended to the idea that you should be able to control who can learn what about you. This is sometimes called informational self-determination. There are several versions of this notion, including those found in Europe's privacy law, the GDPR, which considers who can process your personal information, and in California's privacy law, the CCPA, which considers who can sell your personal information. And all of these things are definitely part of the notion of privacy, but they are just one part. Privacy is a much broader concept. Writ large, privacy is about freedom. Privacy is about autonomy. Privacy is about dignity. Privacy is about self-determination. Privacy is the, the ability to have personal thoughts without undue external influence. Privacy is how we grow as individuals and how we grow as a society. What do I mean by that? As individuals, privacy gives us the space to explore different facets of ourselves, to communicate with like-minded people. And this is especially important for youth and for example, LGBTQ youth, and as a society, it would be hubristic to believe that our current set of social norms are the best possible ones. 20 years ago, same-sex marriage was illegal. Just a few years ago, marijuana was illegal. Privacy gives people the space to break current laws and violate current social norms so that there's room for those laws and those norms to change. If an all-seeing surveillance system made breaking laws impossible, we would not be able to change them. To learn more about the many facets of privacy, I recommend Daniel Solov's short paper, But I've Got Nothing to Hide and Other Misunderstandings of Privacy, or for a longer read, his book, Understanding Privacy. If you're still not convinced why we should care about privacy, I have a few more examples for you. You might care about privacy if, for example, you use social media to chat with friends and family in China. Simply forwarding an offhand meme, posting about the US's CDC response to COVID-19, or speaking about politics on WeChat is monitored. Your posts are censored and removed without you even knowing. And it, those posts could potentially put your safety and that of your friends and family at risk. The Citizen Lab has some really excellent reporting on this if you wanna check out the link below the image. You might care about privacy if, for example, you're on a research trip or a visit to Iran, Sudan, or any of the 10 other countries where being gay carries the death penalty, or visiting one of the 50 additional countries where being LGBT2Q is simply criminalized. And you realize 
once you hit the airport border control that you forgot to wipe the grinder and scruff dating apps off your phone. You may care about privacy if you and your friends attended a Black Lives Matter rally, a land back event, or a climate change walk, or you just happened to be walking through town at the same time a protest was held. Your phone signals and geotag tweets can be scooped by your local police and RCMP. Your face can be photographed and fed into facial recognition tools and compared to photos that have been scraped from your very own Facebook page and your name flagged for further monitoring, which is much more likely if you attended multiple protests or are a member of a racialized minority, such as if you're indigenous. You may care about privacy if you just live streamed about being depressed on Facebook. Your post can be flagged, monitored, and then cut off air in real time by Facebook. This is censorship justified as part of Facebook's suicide prevention initiatives. Facebook, while ostensibly concerned about your mental health, also makes money from all the predatory ads that are then placed on your page by third-party advertisers who now identify and target your perceived vulnerabilities and insecurities to sell makeup, self-help, and weight loss tools, a process detailed by Kathy O'Neill's book, Weapons of Math Destruction. So why do I personally care about privacy? I initially came to privacy research more than 15 years ago when identity theft was becoming a new thing we should worry about. So I started researching it. What were we supposed to do to protect ourselves and our personal information? In short, I found that protection was kind of useless. We normal mere humans could never do all the things that banks and consumer protection agencies and governments were telling us to do to keep us safe from shredding all our address mail and magazine mailing stickers and receipts to not sharing personal information in emails online or over the phone or not even shopping online to storing all of our personal information in a locked location. Moreover, doing all of these things would make us paranoid, but it wouldn't actually protect us. The vast amount of identity theft cases were rooted in more institutional level data breaches insecure databases, government employees leaving their work laptops on the train, or folks who just are plain disgruntled and sold massive troves of our private information to the highest bidders. The point about all this advice wasn't about protecting ourselves or to help us. It was to get us to blame ourselves when we were inevitably victimized. Rather than looking at these larger systems of information collection that put us, put us at risk, and asking why they had all of this information laying about in the first place, we blamed ourselves. For example, thinking, I was a victim of identity theft because I didn't use the latest shredder, or I bought my Christmas presents online. And meanwhile, the banks and the credit card agencies were telling us to protect ourselves. Those same agencies were making money off the back end, selling us identity theft insurance and privacy tools. In the end, recovering a stolen identity was the greatest victimization of all in some cases requiring hundreds of hours on hold in bureaucratic hell, forcing us to share and send out more and more copies of our personal information, including our social insurance numbers, our driver's licenses, our passports and healthcare cards to prove that we were who we said we were, to dozens of agencies, creating this greater spiral of risk. It's really depressing stuff. So I did what any reasonable researcher would do. I shifted topics to video games. Yeah, I copped out. But issues of privacy and surveillance followed me back in. From how playful wearables like our Fitbits collect our data, they tell us more secrets about our bodies than we seem to know ourselves. In the process, they tell us exactly what to value and what we should think is healthy. And they tell others how much of an insurance risk we are or where we went running last night. I saw privacy issues creeping into game development as these games that we carry in our phones, in our pockets, gather or play our information on the fly, both to learn about how to do things like fix glitches, as well as levels that are so hard that we quit in frustration, but also to learn what color our individual store buy buttons should be to make us spend more money in game, or how to detect when we're about to quit and thus reward us with some bonus loot drop or drop the difficulty level so we spend more and more time hooked into our devices, or how to figure out our social value in games, monitoring our in-game chats and our out-of-game friends lists, 
and giving us preferential treatment if we're seen as someone who might convince other players to join in or stay longer. I also took a look at why independent app developers end up integrating all of these third party API tools that collect user data, even though they really have no desire nor intention to use the data in the sneaky ways I just explained. It's just that in the search to pay rent or to do six different jobs in your startup game development role, you don't think of privacy or have a privacy or information security expert handy to figure out what you should do. And sharing player data is simply the cost of a free tool, the cost of getting the data that you actually do need to show to publishers and investors. So what can we do to protect privacy? To start, it depends who we are. The people watching this inaugural CPI talk include high school students, university students, both undergraduate and graduate students, university researchers, people in industry, people in government, and people just living their lives who may be interested in this topic or how the state of the world in cybersecurity and privacy affects them. And the answer is different for different people for sure. For the average person, we often hear suggestions like, look for the little lock icon in your web browser. Don't click on attachments. Use a different and complex password on every website. These are sample passwords that you may not want to choose to use. Uh, these suggestions, while, while good, reveal a more fundamental truth. We as technologists have failed you. We have given you dangerous technologies that appear to be safe. It should not be up to you the person using the technology to have to go out of your way to use it safely. You shouldn't have to decide, do I want to talk to my friend Alice or do I want to talk to my friend Alice securely and privately? The technology shouldn't make you make that choice. And some might say it shouldn't even let you make that choice. Arguably, there should be only one way to do a thing and it should be the secure and private way. So for those of us who are technologists, we have to up our game. We have to do better at producing devices, apps, and tools that protect people's security and privacy. But what I mean there is not that there should be new kinds of technologies specifically designed to protect security and privacy. Rather, all devices, apps, and tools that interact with people and their information should be designed from the start with security and privacy in mind. But it's not just the technologists for whom privacy is important. Privacy impacting technologies affect all aspects of our lives, and the study of privacy demands attention from a wide variety of disciplines. We want the things we build today to yield an ethical and equitable future and to ameliorate inequalities rather than exacerbate them. Drawing on expertise outside of computer science and engineering is thus vital. Here we see the logos of the three major research funding agencies in Canada, respectively for health research, natural sciences and engineering, including mathematics, cryptography and computer science, and social science and humanities research. Sociology, law, health, government, humanities, and more all have important roles to play in shaping the future of privacy in Canada and around the world. And the CPI's interdisciplinary nature opens great opportunities for such collaborations across different sectors, such as academia, industry, nonprofits, civil society, and governments, and also across disciplines. Professor Whitson and I debuted one such interdisciplinary collaboration last year in the form of a graduate seminar course entitled Surveillance and Privacy. The idea for this course came about when she and I were discussing our respective graduate seminars we had been teaching, mine in computer science and hers in sociology, and discovered we were using a number of the same readings to introduce our topics, but the reading list sharply differed after that. We decided to create a new course that could be of interest to graduate students across campus. This course had a mix of computer science, sociology, legal studies, English, global government students, a little over 20 in all. 
for each class session, each student had to read one computer science paper and one social science paper and write a review of one of them. We aim to have the two papers thematically related, as can be seen here. On this class day, the students read about Shoshana Zuboff's notion of surveillance capitalism, where big tech companies collect and profit from the residual data that trails behind us in our everyday activities. They also read about a study of a particular example of this behavior, namely how Facebook uses personally identifiable information, PII, to target people with advertising. You might think that the computer science students would have reviewed the computer science papers and the social science students would have reviewed the social science papers, but it was great to see how much crossover there actually was. One of the students would present each paper to the class and lead a group discussion about the paper. The discussions were always extremely interesting, drawing from the diverse academic and life backgrounds of the class. The topics of the course readings spanned a, broad range, spanned a broad range of aspects of surveillance and privacy. Some examples are listed here. When we designed the course, we had intended it to be the usual in-person kind of class, but then, you know, everything changed. So we held the class online, but it went very well. That format also allowed some students to attend, for example, those with jobs that would otherwise, it would have been harder for them. We do hope to offer the class again in the future, hopefully in person next time. The final part of the course was a project. The students worked in teams, which were required to be interdisciplinary, to perform original research in the area of surveillance and privacy. One of the goals of this course was that the students would gain experience with this kind of interdisciplinary collaboration. These teams each performed a study, created an artifact, and produced a formal research paper on their topic. We'll see a number of examples of these projects over the course of today's talk, in fact. One of the projects seen here, Alexi Orchard from English and Olivier Poulain, Shannon Veach, and Jia Wu from Computer Science, collaborated to analyze sleep tracking apps for smartphones. They looked to see what kind of personal information the apps were collecting, where they were sending that information, and whether they were complying with their own privacy policies, let alone with privacy laws. Hint, they often were not. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> One of the really beautiful outcomes of the course was how it became this building block to connections and projects outside of the class itself. For example, Sang Ho Sa here is a PhD candidate in the Human Computer Interaction Lab. And he took his coding strip project, which he developed under the supervision of Professor Edith Law in computer science, and collaborated with classmates in our course, Eden McConan in sociology and legal studies, Aisha Sazad in global governance, and, and Stephanie Stariva in English to turn coding strip into privacy tune, a prototype tool that educators could use for creating um, comic strips and learning activities that teach students about privacy and security. But the project didn't end there with the final class. Through the course, Sang Ho met Professor Leah Zhang Kennedy, an assistant professor at the Stratford School of Interaction Design and Business, who uh, leads us to our second of our four case studies that we wanted to talk about tonight. Dr. Zhang Kennedy just so happened to specialize in building and evaluating privacy awareness and educational tools for children, especially the role of comics. And so this includes authoring her own interactive ebook, Cyber Heroes, and creating a series of interactive graphic novels and comics, secure comics, uh, and working with Media Smarts, which is a Canadian NGO that provides digital literacy tools and training to get these resources into the hands of Canadian teachers and parents. After the course ended, Sang Ho continued working on the project with Professor Zhang Kennedy, Professor Law, and Sydney Lanria, a user experience designer and graduate of Stratford's MDEI program. And they reworked Privacy Tune into a research tool for generating and collecting visual data, such as the cartoons and images. And so in this 2.0 version of Privacy Tune, participants are asked to draw privacy and security related concepts. 
And then these drawings that participants make are then used to help researchers identify users' mental models. For example, by gathering the cartoons and images drawn by high schoolers, researchers can better understand what Canadian teenagers think privacy is, why it's important, or how they think specific security tools work. And then these mental models are used to identify common misconceptions and gaps in our knowledge about how something like encryption works, and thus point to how we can improve security and privacy education. And at this point, I wanna bring the discussion back to Professor Zen Kennedy, who started her career first as a designer and worked in industry for a few years before earning her doctorate in computer science. And so Professor Zen Kennedy is uh, an interaction designer and user experience researcher now in the Faculty of Arts. And so in one person, she exemplifies what I find really exciting about blending disciplines including the highly technical with the sometimes soft and squishy human behavior side with the creative artistic design side. And I'll give you an idea of what I mean with just a few more of her current projects. So Professor Zan Kennedy's early work, like the comics I mentioned just now, focused on how we can learn about privacy and security, specifically building and evaluating tools that help children identify and evaluate privacy risks. And so her projects integrate what's called uh, usable security and the belief that understanding people's cognitive, cognitive processes is going to help us design better privacy tools. For example, understanding our mental models of how we think something like a login password works and our cognitive biases, such as the fact that our puny little human brains really can't remember more than seven or so passwords that look like this. Um, can help us either redesign passwords to be something much more memorable or help us move to something that's much more secure and sustainable in the long term, like password managers, which do the remembering for us. And so this necessitates an approach rooted in psychology, understanding human cognition and our mental limitations to figure out just what is reasonable and unreasonable to ask us users to do in the name of privacy as well as understanding how persuasion and behavioral nudges work in order to actually do that thing. Professor Zhang Kennedy's work also touches on educating the educators, such as running design workshops for privacy and security researchers, teaching them how they can import and adapt user experience and inter interaction design methods and tools in their own privacy research to create more usable and delightful privacy projects. And so her work is branching out in other directions as well, following the threads that Professor Goldberg pointed out earlier. Kids shouldn't have to be privacy experts. It shouldn't be their responsibility to educate themselves when they go online. Privacy needs to be built in at the design stage because once a software product is released, it's too late to easily address the security and privacy problems to put that genie back in the bottle. And it's unethical to expect the children to fix those mistakes for a developer. And so to increase impact, we need to move upstream from users. And so this was the impetus for running last October's Think Privacy event, which was hosted by the Stratford School of Interaction Design and Business and sponsored by the Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute. The five-day design jam focused on providing training and tools for future designers, UX professionals, and founders of startups. Tools and training that would help them in their careers better design for privacy at the very earliest stages. And so similar to a hackathon, the Design Jam asked participants, how might we connect people and create a sense of togetherness while still protecting everyone's privacy? And as you can see, uh, this is a question that was made so much more vitally important to answer as we shifted to online life mandated by COVID-19. And so the online event featured both industry and academic speakers skill development workshops, pre-recorded talks with live question and answer periods, and directly networked the 50 plus undergrad and grad participants with experts and mentors who provided expertise and advice and check-ins along the way throughout each day. 
And as a sidebar, it just so happens that one of the three winning teams was from our class. Ale Luz Lam, Utsaf Das, and Marvin Pafla from computer science, along with James Belichka and Helen Chin from sociology and legal studies, prototyped the design and interface for Secretum, a, a decentralized and open source communication tool for activists and event organizers. This think privacy event really encapsulates a larger theme in Professor Zane Kennedy's work, stemming from her industry design background. There's a lot of research, including abstract theory about how about privacy by design principles. And industry and government agencies that work with user data are supposed to follow these privacy by design principles that you see here, these seven points. But Professor Zhang Kennedy was really frustrated, both as a researcher and a designer, by the absolute absence of pragmatic tips on how to actually apply these principles, how to actually design for privacy that we could use in our day-to-day -day practices. And so as a solution, she decided to create a course around it. In GBDA 414 at the Stratford School, students learn about potential security and privacy issues that arise when we interact with consumer tech. They do hands-on activities to learn how to apply a privacy conscious mindset during the design stage of a product. For example, uh, an example of how this might work is way back in 2008, Alicia McDonald and Laurie Faith Craner did a study and they estimated it would take the average person 25 days out of every year to read all of the terms of the service for just the websites an average person visits. So one of the first assignments of Professor Zhang Kennedy's course was to ask students to redesign privacy notices to increase their accessibility and readability. And so we see uh, one of the outcomes here, uh, it's really excellent, lovely student work. Other coursework includes mapping a typical user's journey as they navigate through the experience of installing their new smart home device such as their new Nest thermostat or Alexa voice assistant, and analyzing the potential security and privacy issues, mapping them out as a user might navigate through them as they unbox, install, and start using the product in their home. Then as a final project, students prototype their own privacy-aware design solutions to help young people manage privacy on their own devices. And I really love this direction in Professor Zhang Kennedy's work and our current project, which conducts interviews and focus groups with security champions and software development teams to learn more about what stops experienced software developers, especially ones that care about privacy from implementing uh, privacy aware solutions in their day-to-day -day development processes. To sum up, to have an even larger impact on privacy, we need to shift from being only reactive, such as figuring out how children can best protect themselves when they go online, to taking a more proactive stance in teaching creatives and entrepreneurs and coders to not only value privacy, but also give them the pragmatic tools and tips to design and build with privacy in mind, so that we don't have to worry about our kiddos needing to protect themselves when they go online. I also think that Professor Zhang Kennedy's work is brilliant because it doesn't assume that the responsibility for privacy and security rests on the shoulders of computer scientists or engineering departments alone. But that important change happens in the hands of product and experienced designers and writers and artists and creators. Building in security and privacy is important also in a larger context. Apps and websites collect a lot of information on users and site visitors. Often they don't even use that data, though sometimes they do sell it to other companies. But also often they get breached and the attackers get all that stored data. Here we see just a sample of such data breaches reported in the news just in the last couple of days. We see soccer stars, dental patients, users of fertility clinics, and the state of Missouri all experiencing significant data losses, again, just in the last couple of days. These breaches happen all the time. Storing users' data can be a liability for companies. But wait, you may say, don't the companies need that data? 
It turns out that using privacy enhancing technologies, including cryptography and other techniques, companies can do a surprising amount of what they need to do without storing users' information, at least not in a readable form. Ideally, of course, a company wouldn't store the information at all. The single best way to ensure that a company's user and customer data cannot be breached is simply to not be holding it at all. There have been some recent advances, however, in advanced cryptographic techniques that allow companies to process data without even being able to read the data. While great advances have been made in the past several years, this is still an active area of research to make these techniques more efficient and practical, but it's something to keep an eye on in the not too distant future. My formal postdoctoral researcher, Dr. Akshaya Mani and I are working with The Markup, a nonprofit news organization. The Markup does investigative journalism with an eye on big tech and these some would say often shady things that they get up to. Privacy is a big focus of theirs. They care about how companies control information to shape people's lives. As an example from just last week, the markup published an expose on how Amazon prioritizes its own brands when you search for things on Amazon. One of the really cool things about the markup is that along with their stories, as you see here, they publish detailed descriptions of their methodology in coming to their conclusions. And they also publish all of their code and data so that anyone can replicate their results. It is replicable science applied to journalism. Very cool and important work. And you can see this at the GitHub URL here. You can get all their code, all their data and re run it to reproduce and reanalyze the results they got. As I mentioned, the markup cares a lot about the privacy of users of technology, including the internet, and including the readers of their very own website. The markup recognizes the dangers of storing information about the people who read its website and wants to do as little of it as it can. If they don't hold that information, they can't leak it in a data breach, and they can't expose it, for example, in, the, in response to a subpoena. However, as a nonprofit, it is important that it be able to learn statistics, such as approximately how many people are visiting the website, so they can measure how successful they are and raise money for their operations. Dr. Mani and I discussed with them what kinds of statistics they needed, how accurate those statistics need to be, what information they were and were not willing to store, and so on. We came up with a number of privacy-preserving techniques, some used by others previously, some newly invented by us, to gather these statistics privately. The reason we needed different techniques is that different statistics had different requirements. I'll show a simple and simplified example. The markup would like to know how many unique visitors come to its website every day. If the question were just how many total site visits there were, that would be extremely easy to do privacy, privately. Just keep a counter and add one to it every time someone visits and you don't have to store any information about their identities or their IP address, great. But here, the actual question is how many unique visitors are there? So if the same person visits 10 times in a day, you only want to count them once, not 10 times. And importantly, you definitely do not want to keep a list of who has already visited today. So you have to think about this a bit to come up with a, a, a way to do this. But here's an analogy that shows the trick. We're going to play a dice game. Every time someone visits the website, they roll a die. This die, however, has a few unusual properties. First of all, it's not a six-sided die. It's more like one of those Dungeons and Dragons types of die. So here's a D30. Second, this die is somewhat is extremely unusual, I will say, in that if the same person rolls the same die over and over, they will always get the same value. So it's a weird die in that respect. But different people can get different values for the same die, 
And one person can get different values if I give them different dice. The third weird thing about this die is the die is weighted. So it's not a fair die. Not every number comes up with the same likelihood. In fact, the way it's set up is that every number will come up twice as often as the number after it. So half the people when they roll the die will get a one. And if they roll it again, they'll get a one again. And a quarter of people, so half the people will get a one and half the people will get something bigger than one. Within that half of people getting something bigger than one, a quarter of people will get two and a quarter of people will get something bigger than two. An eighth of the people will get three and an eighth of the people will get something bigger than three and so on. So what do we do? Every day the server creates a new die and every time someone visits, they roll the die and the server just looks at the number they rolled. And the only thing the server stores, it doesn't store the identities or the IP addresses of every visitor. The only thing the server stores is the highest number it's seen rolled today. We'll initialize it with zero. Okay, so let's do an example. When the first visitor arrives, say they roll a two, the server sees that's higher than what it has recorded and it updates its stored high value to two. No matter how many times the same user visits today, they'll always roll a two, and so it won't change the stored number. When the second visitor arrives, let's say they roll a one. That's not higher than the stored value of two, so the stored value is not changed. And again, no matter how many times the second user visits today, it will stay at two and so on. Later on, a bunch of visitors come. Later on, another visitor rolls a three. So the highest value is updated to three and other visitors show up over the course of the day, right? The next visitor might get a one, the stored value stays at three, okay? And at the end of the day, all the server does is looks at the highest numbers it has seen, the highest number it has seen today, suppose it's three. Since it's the case that one eighth of people roll a three and one eighth of people roll a four or more, there have probably been, if the highest number you saw was three, there have probably been about eight people who have visited the site today. And all the server has stored is this single number of the highest roll it's seen today and no information. Importantly, the server has never stored any information about who has visited the site. At the end of the day, the server just changes the die to start a new day, resets the stored value to zero and starts again. This is a simplified example, of course. There are tweaks you can do to improve the accuracy. And if you want to gather more complex statistics, such as how many people are visiting from each country, you will want to use other techniques, including differential privacy and trusted execution environments, which are hot areas of research right now. As our last case study, I want to make a shift here to talk not about interdisciplinary projects, but the models for how we can work and do research in interdisciplinary ways. Interdisciplinary work is hard. If you've ever been on work projects that had members from other fields or backgrounds, you often feel as if they're from a completely different world than you. You don't even know what language they're speaking, let alone agree what you wanna do and how to get there. And making sure you're all working in the same direction always seems to take much more time than expected. And this is why I get excited about the work of Professor Mul Adam Molnar in the Department of Sociology and Legal Studies, who really cleverly has created a modular plug and play scaffold for how privacy researchers from different areas and even different countries can work together and how they can work with government, community and industry groups to study different privacy infringing practice products and how they shape our culture. I first heard of Professor Molnar's work on spyware, software that can be installed on your device that covertly gathers information about you and your activity and secretly sends it to another entity. Most researchers focus on spyware that's produced for and used by government to do things like target political opponents, other states, spy on journalists, et cetera. But Professor Molnar took a different direction. He looked at consumer spyware, the off the shelf products like this Flexi Spy pictured here that is used to help parents monitor their children online. 
And he looked at how they were designed, marketed, and actually used to promote gender-based violence, stalkerware. Stalkerware includes apps installed on a person's phone that allow an abusive partner to not only track where you are at all times, but also who you talk to or whether you Googled shelter information, for example. And so the project started when Professor Molnar was in Australia. And the work that I'm gonna describe lays out a template for interdisciplinary research that knits together different experts from computer science to law to sociology, and helps them work with community and industry partners, all working in their own sort of module bubbles is how I'm conceptualizing it here. And so we start with one bubble and the project can start with someone like Professor uh, Molnar, a sociologist and sociolegal so scholar who mapped out domestic violence and how it might be enabled by privacy invading tools that fly under our radar, that market themselves as productivity tools or find my friends, find my phone apps, or software that parents ostensibly use to make sure their children are being safe online. Professor Molnar looked at how vendors like FlexiSpy represented the operators and the targets of legitimate surveillance. And so this marketing analysis is an important step because how we talk about surveillance here impacts how we in general as a society justify it to ourselves and make it okay to do that surveillance. For example, these marketing discourses fuel fears and talk about how romantic partners might be cheating or how kids might be looking at things they shouldn't. Here, invading privacy is framed as the responsible thing for the operator or the stalker um, to do, to show that they care. And so this mapping also includes what's called a digital walkthrough analysis. Uh, that looks at the features of the software to see how the interface design replicates this discourse, as well as to get a full catalog of how it functions. For example, is the installed spyware hidden from the target's home screen on the device? And these types of questions will be important later at the legal analysis stage. But first, we have another stage, and this is the technical analysis of the product in question, and it's done by computer scientists who unpack how the software works, what exact data it collects, how it stores and transmits it, and to whom. With off-the-shelf stalkerware, uh, this includes sending data not only to the abuser, but also can include sending it to other third parties like advertisers and analytics companies. Researchers in computer science map out the key vulnerabilities the software relies on to undermine our security and privacy. Importantly, until the technical analysis is complete, we really don't know what's objectively happening in terms of surveillance. So we can't respond to it with police or the law. The next step then is to send the technical analysis to legal experts who then look at whether developing, selling, purchasing, or using the spyware for this type of surveillance is illegal. This includes scanning the laws or policies in every province, state and country involved and whether the product complies with its own terms of service or breaks any consumer protection laws that might address unfair or deceptive practices in the technical design and the use of the software. And here, the earlier work on the design features and how they might obscure things like consent by hiding the operation of the, um, the application off of your, the front page of your phone become important as well. The technical and legal reports in accessible and really clear language are then sent to computer community partners, which include lawyers and private and criminal frameworks, police and government partners, civil liberties groups, but also journalists. And they're posted publicly so you or I can go and read and learn about these things. In the case of Stalkerware, Professor Molnar's group worked directly with an organization in Australia providing services for victims of domestic abuse. And it helped them prepare and promote threat modeling and risk response strategies that then could be shared more broadly within the family violence sector. For example, helping these victims scan their phones and learn how to dump the Stalkerware and take one more step to dumping the Stalker too. And it doesn't end there. 
the work bounces back and forth. The computer teams still keep working now on building technical solutions and protections that could be deployed, such as spyware detection tools, and publicly sharing their data so that the software creators and the platform vendors and operators that host them can verify, address, and patch any of these issues. For example, if Apple App Store discovers that this, is, this um, software is actually being used as stalkerware, they may decide to stop carrying that product. Meanwhile, the legal teams are working on policy recommendations for government, for example, on how to regulate the consumer spyware industry, partnered with community groups who are also lobbying and pressuring for change. Professor Molnar himself built up this network in a completely different direction. He extended it not just to other disciplines, but replicated it in different countries, first partnering with the Citizen Lab and then coming to here, Waterloo. And so the beauty of this model is that it can be applied just as easily in Canada as it can in Australia for a comparative analysis. And so here I've changed the bubbles to represent different academic disciplines. It's quite easy to add others in at different stages. And so here I popped in community communication and design, but we could also pop in political science, social development studies, public health and a host of other disciplines, all of which could spin off their own projects. And we could add in bubbles for all of the potential community partners, which I'm not gonna picture because it gets really uh, too hard to read at this stage. And these bubbles and disciplines can be added or subtracted as each are working in their own teams, they're leveraging their own unique skills. And while I've shown it here as a linear process because I am limited by Microsoft SmartArt, uh, which only allows me to go in one direction, it doesn't have to be these work and these ideas bounce back and forth. So for example, with the Stockware project, the technical analysis and the stage and the protection stage happen at the same time. But the topic and the object of analysis can change too. It doesn't have to be about Stockware or spyware. The model can be reapplied in new contexts across topics. And so that's just what uh, Professor Molnar is doing here. His new project partners with other researchers, including Professor Urs Hengartner in computer science, as well as civil liberties organizations, lawyers and labor unions across Canada to apply the model to a different set of surveillance technologies. The apps on your computer installed by your employer or, or your university that monitor when and where and how you work, including watching your keystrokes the websites you visit, to accessing your emails, your chat logs, your webcam, and your physical location. And as you all know, these tools have, or suspect, these tools have seen skyrocketing use as we shift to remote work and learning and online learning during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so in this project, they're surveying Canadian companies who design, produce, market, and sell this employee monitoring software. And on the other end, they're also talking to the employers that actually use it to see why they're using it and what they're getting out of it. They're also assessing the socio-technical design of the software to identify how these products are used day to day by the people who they're monitoring and the risks to our privacy and security. And a technical analysis will be conducted to see if the software is actually in compliance with relevant laws and policies including the laws related to employee rights in the workplace, which get much more worky, murky when our workplace just happens to be our bedroom in working at home COVID-19 time. And so again, we need to uncover exactly what these remote monitoring tools are doing so that labor arbitration lawyers and organizations that protect workers like unions can respond to unreasonable and intrusive practices that monitor and measure our every move and every search term we Google 24 seven under the guise of helping us become more productive or better model employees. And that we as employees or students have little power to refuse. This example of workplace surveillance and our inability to say no to it if we wanna continue working is really a case where existing privacy laws fail us. And so there's a lot of work here for the legal analysis teams. And I think that this combination of technical and socio-legal expertise here coupled with the community partnerships is really what makes this 
privacy research matter? So we've talked today about how CPI members collaborate across disciplines within academia, as well as with industry and nonprofits to improve privacy. If this sounds interesting to you, what can you do to help to get involved? Again, it depends on who you are. First, if you're a student, particularly an undergrad, try to get involved in undergraduate research. Pictured here is a paper on combating internet censorship that will be presented next month at the workshop on privacy in the electronic society. The lead author, Anna Lorimer, was an undergraduate working in my group and has now started her graduate studies at the University of Chicago. Um, and so <clears throat> if you're a graduate student, get involved. Or if you're a faculty member, connect with other people whose work inspires you, including faculty members working in the field. A really good opportunity is uh, attending the International Symposium on Technology and Society, which is hosted by uh, the university next week. There are networking sessions for students to sign up and network with top scholars, uh, international scholars, and discuss your ideas on technology, ethics, and social justice with them. You can also uh, audit or enroll in privacy-related classes or ping CPI members to see what they recommend or to give you feedback on your proposed projects. If you already have expert knowledge, get involved in sharing it at conferences and public facing venues, some of which are posted here. Hang out and lurk wherever this new research is being shared. Check out a conference that isn't in your field to see where your own domain specific expertise might really be needed. Or you can donate your time and expertise to organizations that don't specialize in privacy such as running workshops for students, researchers, or activists. Distill your dark arts into something that people without your training can easily understand and apply in their day-to-day -day lives, or do some back-end work that they might not otherwise be, be able to afford to pay for. For example, Professor Goldberg and I are working with Pride Toronto, and they're actively thinking through how they might safely and securely collect and manage community data. And this isn't a typical research project. It's an experiment led by organizations on the ground rather than us researchers in the lab. And it may not go in the direction we thought nor end in a typical conference paper, but it matters. It's work that's worth doing with communities worth serving. And there's lots for us personally to learn along the way. And while many researchers working around privacy and technology very explicitly avoid Facebook and other social media, if you do dabble, you might want to follow some of these excellent folk listed here, like Katie Crockford, Simone Brown, Chris Gilliard, Callie Schroeder, and Wolfie Crystal, and they can help you keep on top of current news events, collective action to protect your privacy, uh, point out useful documentaries, and really give you an idea of what type of cutting edge scholarship is in this domain. Uh, as well, you can check out the websites listed here for some practical knowledge and tools, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, EPIC, the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and Privacy International. If you work at a company or if you run a company, be sure to pay attention to privacy. What data are you collecting about your users or customers? Do you really need that data? Are there ways to do the things you want to do without having that data, or at least without having it in unencrypted form? This matters even to people who are just developing one-off little apps, not only large companies. Do you know your obligations under the privacy laws, not only of your jurisdiction, but those of your users or customers? Do you have people on staff whose job it is to know these things? If not, are there people if not, there are people you can hire to help, and there are ways to develop these competencies in-house. The benefits and the harms of surveillance are unequally distributed. If you're a woman, if you're queer or trans, if you have a Muslim sounding name, or you dress according to your religious dictates, if you're under housed, you know these things already. 
You are familiar with how you are always already being watched and judged and how your behavior is being policed. But if you're not one of these groups, you might simply miss this. And this doesn't make you a bad person, but you might not think of how to design, fix, research solutions to these sorts of things. For example, even our tools for surveillance are biased as researchers Joy Bellawimi and Tina Jibru found in their Gender Shades project, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. They found that facial recognition software misidentified darker skinned women more than one third of the time. And the implications for this are stunning from faulty police stops to simply not being unable to unlock your stupid smartphone. Trained on photo data sets of mostly white men and developed and tested by mostly white men, facial recognition commonly fails to see anyone other than these white men. And so it took two women of color a simple, short, relatively straightforward study to see it improve it and figure out how to fix it. So the solution to this is to make sure that your own classrooms, your own research teams, your own collaborators, your own office mates are not so homogenous. They're not always so white. They're not always so male, but rather put in the work to include a much broader intersectional representation. And yeah, hiring folk that aren't just like us is a lot harder sometimes. This means that we need to recruit in new places, recruit harder, look again at our job calls and our scholarships, look again at our lab and classroom culture to make sure we're actively calling out and encouraging and valuing wider participation. Particip potentially or especially from those who have different qualifications than what we normally look for and promote more of these folk into leadership positions to keep that cycle going. And it will definitely be worth it. If only to avoid the face palm moment of being like IBM and discovering that your surveillance technology is actually really, really, really terrible at actually doing surveillance. And what can you do no matter who you are? We said at the beginning that it would be better not to have to make individual choices to help your privacy, that we technologists should have designed the internet better to begin with so that you wouldn't have to. But that's not where we are, so you probably do. As it happens to turn out today, October 21st, 2021, is the first Global Encryption Day. And various organizations, such as the Electronic Frontier Foundation that Professor Whitson mentioned earlier, are encouraging people today to try secure and private communications tools. While it's not a perfect advice, today's a good day to give privacy protecting programs and services a try. Firefox or even Tor browser for web browsing, DuckDuckGo for search, Signal for communications, and so on. And no matter who you are, if you enjoyed this inaugural CPI talk, you may be interested both in future talks in the CPI talk series, as well as those in the CRISP speaker series on privacy, where we have the past 10 years of interdisciplinary talks about all aspects of privacy posted to our website and YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I think now uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and we can open it up to question and answer or if anybody has any comments to share. Um, I appreciate that we are moving into your dinner hour or past it. Um, but we do have one I think we can start with. And, and, and Paul asked, um, the issue of Facebook hiding and intervening when users post depression and suicidal thoughts is interesting one. And so if we're gonna put aside the advertising aspect, which is perhaps a distinct concern, what should Facebook be doing instead? And where should the trade-off be? Is it okay if more users commit suicide because Facebook respects their privacy more? This is a great question. And, and one I'm not, I, I'm sure uh, Professor Goldberg can, can weigh in on, in on. I'm not sure I have the answer to this. And this is a really good example of where we might need ethicists and philosophers to weigh in about at what point should Facebook intervene? Um, I think part of the larger question is that Facebook is using um, algorithms and automated um, 
automated searching to flag whether something is, is potentially suicidal or not. And so they're automating this whole intervention process. And so there's a lot of cases where they may be cutting off things that aren't at, at all suicidal, um, or they're sort of doing it all with machines instead of intervening with people. And I think that that is perhaps um, a stickier question about what point are they handing off all of these uh, responsibilities, ethical responsibilities to automated uh, processes or, or censoring speech that um, should be there in the first place. Professor Goldberg, do you yeah. have any comments? Um, another thing just along those lines, I think that that was a, a great answer. It is difficult to know. Um, but faith, I mean, it's a little rich to, to think that Facebook is actively um, worrying about the, the mental health of their users. They have their, the famous example of them doing um, uh, psychological studies without any kind of ethical oversight framework on their users where they would present some users with positive news stories and some users with negative news stories and see how they reacted. And I mean, that's not great. Um, and of course, wherever we say Facebook here, I, I understand in, in a hot minute, they're changing their name to something else. So uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think one more thing I think on, on the point about Facebook and depression is that uh, there are also currently um, uh, doing studies where they can predict whether somebody has some sort of mental health condition or depression from looking at their past posts over time. And I think that this sort of... Um, endeavor is a little bit um, uncomfortable to me, right? I, I don't want a social media corporation making medical diagnoses, um, I, you know, whether they're accurate or not, and they may be more accurate than, than some trained medical professionals. I don't think I trust social media companies or why they're doing it. And so the underlying rationale as to why they're doing it always has to come down to a profit motive. Um, and so that's that's sort of um, a part of, of this discussion that makes me uh, uncomfortable. And so we have another question here from Dave. If I may uh, exercise my chest privilege, I wanted to ask a follow-up question to what Paul raised. Um, so first of all, thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, I think Paul's question is, a, is an instance of a broader type of uh, argument that comes up. Uh, often with sort of privacy versus something else. Uh, where do you draw the line? So I think you, you pointed out rightly that you know, Facebook is perhaps not the, the exemplar protector of uh, um, uh, people's rights, but the same argument comes up like uh, privacy versus national security or privacy versus law enforcement. Um, so uh, do, you, do you have, uh, like, what's your take on that? Is, is there a real conflict or, or is that something that again, something that, that needs uh, philosophers and ethicists to weigh in? I mean, at some point it needs uh, philosophers and people who think about it, but there are, the, the placing of privacy and policing or national security in opposition is often false to begin with. And um, the uh, papers I mentioned earlier, uh, but I've got nothing to hide and other misunderstandings of privacy actually talk about this uh, very well, where the thing you're weighing against is not the entirety of the policing or national security apparatus versus an individual's right to privacy. Privacy is a societal good. Society is a better place to be because people have privacy. And what you're weighing against is the societal benefit of privacy versus not the totality 
of the uh, policing or the or whatever the policing uh, apparatus, but the incremental um, change between a policing apparatus that is transparent and accountable and uh, has a robust warrant process versus one that does uh, a global surveillance to find people without individualized suspicion, right? So the, the placing of uh, privacy and, and national security or law enforcement at loggerheads is often uh, much more fictitious than you would think. Thank you. So there are more questions in the Q&A, so I'll, I'll let you get on with those. Yeah. So Dave has a really great question. He said, uh, Helen Nissenbaum has developed the notion of privacy as contextual integrity. Um, and are we familiar with the framework? And is she one of the Chris speaker series in the past decade? No, she's not. I would love to have her. She's, she's uh, amazing because she is one of those researchers that works across so many fields. Um, and so Ian and I have both used her work in our respective courses and we have used her work in, and our students are familiar with her in our grad session. Um, Ian, did you want to give the rundown of contextual integrity? Uh, no, you can go ahead. Uh, I, I please don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get into technical details um, at, at this level of talk. Okay, it sounds good. But um, I would definitely uh, recommend uh, her work because it is one of those points that's really accessible. Um, and I do like all of them, the things that their lab does in terms of building privacy blockers and ad blockers um, and things like that. But the idea is that privacy and who we share our information with, it changes according to the context within which we're operating and how that information is going to be used. Uh, but she comes at the question, looking at it from a little bit more of a, a law framework as well in certain points. Yeah, and that, so, that, sorry, that important point of how, what the information gathering uh, is used for is, at least as important as what information is being gathered. And this actually has um, relationship to other law. I've been working with um, some lawyers um, at the University of Toronto and elsewhere about uh, related projects involving um, what, what kinds of warrants should be needed to get like communications metadata, for example. And the government is actually uh, recently was asking for kind of feedback on a new proposed um, kind of framework, uh, which includes this question. Um, so somebody else asked, what's the point of using Signal if there aren't people to talk to there? Is there a way to popularize these tools so that the free market promotes them? Um, and I, I would say that this might be a, a misapprehensive, misapprehension, misconception about Signal. Uh, I can use Signal uh, to text or phone um, anybody I like. Um, it's only when the people that I'm talking to are also using Signal that it's secure, but I can use Signal with the warning that pops up is that this other user isn't using Signal. Uh, so, you know, be, be aware that this isn't uh, encrypted or private uh, discussions. So I think that, that that is useful, but I mean, Ian, did you want to weigh in on that? How do we popularize tools like Signal so that we promote them? Oh, sorry. I just, Zoom just died on me and <laughs> reconnected. Computers. Um, so this is an example of where uh, technology has failed us. Again, we shouldn't have to be balkanized into all these different, I use this app, you use this app, you use this app, right? It should just be that when we want to communicate with each other, it's secure. Unfortunately, that's not where we are now, which is uh, the sad part. 
but um, it would be uh, it would be better, of course, if uh, just the default way of communicating was secure. And like Apple has gone a long way toward this. The standard Apple iMessage communication is in fact encrypted. Um, a lot of people don't realize that. And it's not encrypted in the best possible way. There's a big asterisk next to it, but it's definitely more secure than regular text messaging or regular um, unencrypted communication. And these uh, kind of widely deployed uh, systems that have security and privacy uh, built into them are definitely the way to go. You shouldn't have to convince all your friends to uh, stop using whatever it was they were using and switch to something else. When my team and I developed off the record messaging or OTR, uh, what, like 15, 18 years ago now, something like that. Oh goodness, I'm old. Um, um, we very explicitly made it so that it is a layer that sits on top of whatever communication tool you already used. Right? You didn't have to convince all your friends to go get this new program to communicate with them securely. It's just you installed the tool. And if your friend happened to also install it, then they would notice each other and just switch to encrypted kind of transparently. You might not even realize it had happened if you didn't watch the little icons very carefully. Right, So um, that kind of transparent, opportunistic protection uh, should be the norm. I, I am strongly of the belief that the IETF, which is the body that kind of standardizes um, protocols for the internet, things that make the internet work, I strongly uh, believe that they should never again um, standardize a protocol that sends plain text over the internet. There's just no reason to do it. And, and the quick and easy solution to getting the free market to promote them is to do an end run around the free market via laws and regulations that say that force um, companies and, and agencies to not do these things, right? And say, you can no longer be um, insecure. You must be private by default. Um, so regulatory pressure and, and laws. Um, there's a comment, does CIS flag me for watching Chris privacy videos? And that's a question coming from a self-censoring part of the human brain and behavior. When you're watching videos online, you should always, always watch them as if somebody else knows you might be watching them. <laughs> no, to be, to be um, maybe a little more specific, if you watch the Chris speaker series on privacy on YouTube, the fact that you watched it, who knows who knows that, right? YouTube definitely knows that, who knows where else it's going. But we also allow you just to download the videos from our website directly and just watch them directly from our website exactly for this reason. And so if you are worried about someone knowing what videos you're watching, you can not give that information to Google and YouTube, and you can just watch the videos directly on our website. We will know what you watched, but there's the trade-off. There's a, a question about digital identity. Does it mean discouraging the collection and storage of personally identifying information in conflict with advocating? Is it, is it in conflict with advocating for digital identity? Um, I'm not quite sure what the question is asking. Ian? I'm not sure either. It doesn't mean discouraging. Oh, I see. It's missing an is. Okay. Does it mean that discouraging the collection and storage of PII is in conflict with advocating for digital identity? So the answer is no. Um, so there are lots of digital identity kind of frameworks, even today that are starting to be rolled out that are privacy protective. So they're uh, basically individuals get to direct 
where their PII goes and to some extent what it can be used for. And it's not just um, something everyone can see. So individuals using these um, identity frameworks can uh, say that these organizations get to know these things about me and these organizations are allowed to tell these other organizations these things about me. Now, as you might imagine, are people really going to configure all these checkboxes and say who can do what? This is a big question right now. This is still early days. Um, but you might imagine in your Apple wallet, for example, you might have a card that is more privacy friendly and that is actually happening right now. You can, you can get these identity frameworks. Um, I'm pretty sure in actual a Apple wallet today that, uh, can, uh, protect your private information. The next question is asking, the internet was originally designed to be an open system, something that it succeeded at. And so how can privacy uh, thrive in this context? Uh, and again, I think sometimes the, the, there's a false dichotomy between privacy and open. Um, but in this case, a good example was thinking about the benefits of forgetting, right? If our data is ephemeral or it loses its precision over time, we still have an open internet with an open flow of information. It just means that data about us cannot be stored in perpetuity and linked with other pieces of data about us. Right, for example, um, on social media, say Twitter, it's useful to be able to see someone's tweets from a week ago. Is it really useful to be able to see someone's tweets from 10 years ago? That doesn't seem like a really important feature of Twitter. And it is actually has a lot of negative value because people have changed over 10 years, hopefully. And uh, not permanently storing every off the cuff tweet that someone makes um, is probably for the better. Um, but, and I know there are tools that um, people can use that will automatically like delete their old tweets after some amount of time. And uh, again, this isn't in conflict with the openness of the internet. It's, it's a open private internet is what, uh, hopefully we can go for. So we are coming up to the end of our time. Um, we can perhaps take one more question. There's one question that's specifically addressed to Ian uh, uh, from Dave. So Ian, if you want to quickly respond to that. Um, yeah, I, sure. I can read the question so everybody can hear um, or read it if you don't see it. It's to follow up on the earlier question of the trade-offs of privacy versus harm prevention, such as in the case of CSAM or child pornography. Some like Alex Stamos have advocated a balanced approach of not siphoning information off of users' devices, but using on-device intelligence to suggest to users, uh, for example, using uh, private, uh, their private messaging apps, if their messages are, for example, instances of suicidal ideation, and to suggest treatment through helplines and services to go to for help. So doing all of this, all without gathering user data and exfiltrating it off of your device like your phone. And so Ian, do you reckon this is a good trade-off or a balance of privacy versus harm reduction or privacy and harm reduction? So the question actually asks two different questions, which in my mind have two very different answers. So there's uh, one question, which is, should your phone realize that you're tweeting uh, suicidal things and alert you locally without telling anyone else. Just it has figured out that you're feeling down today. Should it do something about it? Um, there are a bunch of products kind of in the pipeline to do that. It has some amount of creepiness factor for sure. If it doesn't actually report that information off the phone, but it's basically like a wellness monitor, it has not none, but way less privacy implications. On the other hand, the question also asks about CSAM, 
child sexual abuse material and also oddly cybersecurity awareness month which was a poor choice of acronym i believe but um um so there the somewhat short-lived apple plan was that the phone would monitor all your pictures and if it decided you had a bunch of CSAM on your device, then it would report you. And it's a little more complicated than that, but that's the general idea. And that has a completely different kind of privacy landscape because there your phone is acting against your interests, right? And then, so in computer science, we have this, or in computer security, we have this concept called a trusted computing base, right? It's the kind of, minimal set of things that you have to trust to keep yourself secure and private. And if those things start working against you, you basically have completely lost. And in many respects, your phone, or at least your phone's operating system is definitely part of your trusted computing base. If your phone is working against you, <laughs> there's, really uh, not far you can get with security and privacy. And so there have been calls to make um, these kinds of devices, like uh, mobile devices, smart home devices, your, your uh, Amazon Echo, your smart TVs, your phones, things like that, that have access to all this really personal information about you, to make them be um, to have a fiduciary relationship to you, which means that they are legally required to work for your benefit and not against your interests. And I think that's a very important direction that uh, hopefully we'll see some movement on in the not too distant future. Because as long as these devices can be actively working against you, then we have very little hope of uh, achieving security and privacy. Thank you. I yeah. think we're out uh, of time. So I, I uh, apologize for the people whose questions we couldn't get to, but I'm sure Professors Whitson and Goldberg uh, would be happy to receive email from uh, people who have remaining questions or, or other feedback about the, the talks. Um, so let me thank uh, both of you for uh, uh, for an uh, informative and uh, and uh, entertaining talk that also kept the audience engaged. I'm sure this will serve as a, sort of an exemplar for future CPI talks as well. Thank you very much, and, and uh, um, thank you for the audience for staying till the end. Um, next week is our final uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month uh, uh, event. That's going to be a joint keynote with the IEEE uh, International Symposium on Technology and Society that Professor Bitson already mentioned. Um, it'll be on uh, a week from now, Thursday next week, but at 11 o'clock. You can register for this uh, keynote by going to the CPI web page. Uh, thank you very much and uh, have a good evening. Thank you all. Thanks all, have a good night.